welcome to that startup show. I'm Ray Johnston, fresh out of the startup show TARDIS, which is just like the doctors, only it's red and it doesn't travel through time or space. <laughs> and it's kind of crowded on the inside because it's just a phone box. Benjamin Law isn't with us tonight. He decided to adopt an alien parasite, so he's safely tucked away in an airlock while I solo pilot the Starship startup, going boldly where no startup show has ever gone before. We're going deep into space. And I'm there, floating in a tin can far above the world. So tonight, we're looking at space tech startups and asking, why the hell have none of you been able to build a bloody TARDIS yet? <laughs> now, it has been a big year in space news. That's right, there has been a new Star Wars movie, which hasn't happened since 2017. <laughs> But back to the real world, nerds, that giant expanse of infinity that was once the exclusive territory of astronauts, cosmonauts, and dogs and rats and that monkey that time. It's now becoming a place where entrepreneurs and startups are playing. The new space race isn't the Soviets and the Americans. It's Branson versus Musk versus Bezos versus Australia. We've finally caught up with the rest of planet Earth and got a space agency, folks. Well, a, a bit of cash for one, anyway. <laughs> but do we actually want Aussies in space? I mean, astronauts are supposed to plant flags on celestial bodies, not wear them as capes. Meanwhile, the New Zealanders have beaten us into space via a startup called Rocket Lab. And all this time, they told us Kiwis couldn't fly. <laughs> Rocket Lab offers to get your payload in orbit more affordably through ride sharing. Kind of like Uber for satellites with less controversy. <laughs> I'm hoping to launch an Airbnb on the moon. I'll call it airless B&B. &B. You can give ratings out of five stars, eight planets, and Pluto. Poor Pluto. <laughs> Although, of course, no company's been able to get to the moon yet. In May, Google announced that their $30 million Lunar X Prize for landing a robot on the moon was going to go unclaimed. One of the front runners was the Japanese startup Hakuto, who created a moon rover called Tetris. I'm surprised they weren't able to slot in somewhere. <laughs> Problem was, whenever their landing gear hit the moon's surface, disappeared. <laughs> anyway, we are the ones on the launch pad tonight with some absolutely incredible space biz guests spanning rocket science to virtual space to an actual astronaut. And if you want to join in the conversation, tweet us at TSU Show or use the hashtag that startup show. But now it's time to tap into some of the incredible creative minds in the room as we cross to our correspondent Respondent on the floor, Troy McCann from Moonshot. Who's down there, Troy? And have you got enough oxygen? Thanks very much, Ray. So here with me today, we've got some kid coders from Code Club Australia. And these guys hold the world record for the most kids coding at the same time. Now, Code Club Australia run a competition called Moonhack, a competition where kids from all over Australia and the world get together to learn how to code and to beat their last record attempt. So we're very lucky to have these legends here with us today to show us their amazing coding ability. We've got Ethan and Emily. So guys, could you tell us a little bit about what it is you're building right now? Okay, so the Moonhack project that I'm doing now is the Scratch Moonhack project. I can see, I can see like what seems to be a moon lander and you've got the Earth back there. Is it flying towards the Earth or away from the Earth? It's flying towards the moon. It is meant to represent the Apollo rocket coming down on the moon. Um, the speed and the fuel are represented in the project. That's really cool. So they're variables and they change as the, as the lander moves. Fantastic. So, Ethan, how long have you been coding for? I've been, 
I've been coding for um, this year. And what's your favourite programming language? Um, Python. This, this is really, really cool. Good work, guys. Fantastic. So, as you can see, these guys are on a trajectory to absolutely crush it in the future. But I want you to use some of that creative spirit that you've got right now. And if you're keen to build an actual rocket, does, would you be keen to build a rocket? Yeah? So if you want to come over here, we're going to have a competition with someone from the audience. And we're going to build a prototype Lego rocket. And it's going to help us launch the Australian Space Agency into the final frontier. How's that sound to you guys? Okay, so if you guys wanted to start carefully, come around here and get ready. So we've got some Lego and we've got some pipe cleaners and they're going to do some really creative stuff. But we're going to ask for a little bit of audience participation. So does anyone in the front row here, yeah, let's get excited. Yeah. So how many, how many Aussies in the audience want to build a rocket, would dream of being able to build a rocket? One person? Ah, oh, this is why we haven't had a space agency for so long. Okay, come over here. Come over here. Come, come. So, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Daniel. Daniel, fantastic. Okay, we've got a brand new rocket engineer for the Australian Space Agency. So, uh, if you could just come and stand over here. Um, we'll, uh, we'll come back to you guys in a few minutes and we'll see where you're at. Try to build the best rocket that you can. And uh, for now, over to you, Ray. Now, space is vast infinite, complex, the complete opposite of venture capitalists' attention spans. <laughs> However, there are a number of growing startups that see space as the future of business. Tonight, we have with us three absolute legends of the space tech sector, and we will ask them the most important question for entrepreneurs. In the future, instead of an elevator pitch, will you need a transporter room pitch? <laughs> Our first guest job is not rocket science. Sorry, I've got that wrong. Our first guest job is literally rocket science. <laughs> and she's hoping to build the digital nervous system of the planet. I actually thought a digital nervous system was a gathering of startup CEOs. <laughs> Would you please welcome the CEO of Fleet, Flavia Tardanardini. <laughs> Our second guest is not just going to space, he's creating it. As the head of consumer space-based virtual reality company, he can probably sort out that whole TARDIS thing for me. <laughs> Would you please welcome the director of Opaque Space, Emre Deniz. <laughs> Final guest tonight is a real live NASA astronaut who piloted and commanded several space shuttle missions and has spent over 38 days in space. And after acquiring a taste for the infinite void, she now powers her own space missions. She's the Director of Space Technology and Policy at Nova Systems. Would you please welcome Pamela A. Melroy. <laughs> I am so excited by this lineup. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Now, I'd like to start with one question to the panel. It's a bit of an existential one, really, also a little bit hypothetical. So, the year is 2050 and the Earth is uninhabitable for some reason. I'm not saying it was one of you, <laughs> although it might have been. Uh, Pamela, perhaps we can start with you. Where in the galaxy are we going to be able to relocate Australia to? Oh, well, the obvious answer that jumps to mind is Mars because it has a lot of red dirt <laughs> and it's dry. Now, the only problem that I can see is that Australia just wouldn't be the same without the thousands of kilometres of gorgeous coastline. So I think we're going to have to do a little terraforming first. I like that idea. Emre, do you have any ideas? You take Europa <laughs> and you take Mars <laughs> and you bash them together. <laughs> There's your water. I'm not sure that's going to end how you think it'll end, but all right. The science checks out. Right? <laughs> nicely the done. The science nicely checks done. out, apparently. 
What about you? What do you think? I don't know. I would say in 2050, I think Mars would be already busy by then. Right? I think we have to choose another planet. We've got some optimism on the panel tonight. That's that's very good to see. But we're now we are going to play a game, and this game is called Sci Fact or Sci Fiction, and we're going to read out the name of a company. And you have to buzz in and tell me whether this is a real space startup or whether it's a fictional company from TV, movies, video games. Audience, please don't yell out the answers to these. I know you're going to know them. I can see. I can see you're on the edge of your seats. First up, oh, test your buzzers first. Oh. I love it. Wow. <laughs> first company, Cyberdyne. Trick question. Mm -hmm. Oh, go on. Cyberdyne is fictional. Skynet is real. Oh, come on. Tell me more. <laughs> the name of the UK defense communications network is Skynet. Well. A network of satellites. Did they know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I can tell you it was very hard to keep a straight face when they first told me that. <laughs> So, as you may know, Cyberdyne is from the Terminator series. <laughs> they were the creator of the AI defense system Skynet, uh, <laughs> the one that concludes that humans are the biggest impediment to Earth's safety and then kill us all. So good to know it exists in real life. As, well, let's move on to something a bit less dire. The next company, Planetary Resources. Emre. It's true. You think it's a real company? Yes, but I don't know what they do. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> well, it's a real company and they're doing asteroid mining. That, that is yeah. very, very true. So it it's is. actually quite amazing, you know, going out in space to dig asteroids to get resources for probably going to Mars and doing this big long trip that we'll have to go to go there. Hmm. So just like in Armageddon. With, Probably yeah. without their hotties, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, they might be hotties. Uh, yeah, that is a real asteroid <laughs> mining company, uh, which is the only industry where an expansion phase is known as tightening your belt. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Virgin Galactic. Come on, guys. Yeah, totally true. Yeah, Virgin is our, you know, oh, come on, Virgin Galactic is amazing. And they, they are going to probably give us a beautiful plane to do space tourism in a few years. Oh. Yes, Richard Branson. Again, yes. uh, well, optimistic. Because, yes, Virgin Galactic is real, does exist in the real world, but it's almost a decade on from the date that Richard Branson said we'd see a maiden flight. Uh, so I'm thinking it might be a little bit fictional. <laughs> oh, depending on if you're asking SpaceX or Boeing as well. <laughs> <laughs> Next company, Soylent. <laughs> Trick question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why, Pam? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a little older than you guys, so I actually remember this science fiction movie about Soylent Green. Oh, we have Netflix. And, uh, oh, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, Netflix saves the day. Uh, but in fact, uh, I was astonished to find out that uh, there's a company that's marketing a food product called Soylent right now. Yes, that is actually true. The real world food startup is a liquid meal replacement. I don't know why they decided to name themselves after a fictional food, you know, best known for that green variety. Turned out to be made of people. Uh, ironically, the real world product itself is completely vegan. <laughs> <laughs> so that cannibal market Totally untapped. <laughs> that is the end of our little quiz here. I think we all know the scores. Thanks for playing, guys. It doesn't matter at all. Now it is time for the first of three startups to step into the pitch ring, the place where we are going to help some great new space businesses launch, get off the ground, get into orbit, and hopefully not jettison any boosters. Tonight's winner will not only go into our season grand final, but will also take home the coveted prize that proves they are the mythical Australian version of the unicorn company, the Unaroo. It can hop 
and vomit rainbows all at the same time. <laughs> Our guest panel here will judge the pictures on originality, marketability, scalability, and potential to be abused in an Elon Musk tweet. <laughs> the rules are simple. Rule one, you have two minutes max for your presentation. Rule number two, at 20 seconds to go, you'll hear this sound. Rule number three, we're hoping you would collude with Russian spies. Sorry, I mean wouldn't, wouldn't collude <laughs> with the Russian spies. I love that. <laughs> the panel will give each contestant feedback after their pitch. Let's meet our first pitcher, please. Uh, our first pitcher tonight is so fascinated by the human-machine interface that he once developed a bionic hand that looked just like Wolverine's, only much blunter. You should Google it. Will you please welcome Puya Abulfafi? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Puya, CEO of Visospace. We are a band of tech entrepreneurs passionate and excited about the next frontier of human machine interfaces and human machine and, and human computer interfaces. And virtual reality is gonna play a huge part in that, and that's what we're really interested in. So we're in a space show. I want you to imagine that you can get onto a hoverboard and fly off to the moon. I want you to land in a crater, look down, see a rock go down and pick it up and actually feel it, feel the texture. That's all possible with the kind of technologies that we're working on in, in Visospace. Because we want to be here to build a future with you. So I've only got two minutes, I've got to be quick. I've got our first product here, it's the Alto, it's a prototype. And I'm going to get my lovely assistant here, Simon Pampana, is a TV personality himself. <laughs> Come here, <laughs> give him a round of applause. <laughs> quick Simon, enough time. Okay, quick, quick, okay. put this on. Okay, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to put this on his head. He's going to go into a virtual world. He's going to go into an island called Alto Island. We built it. And he's standing on our Alto. Now, Simon, what are you looking at? Oh, my. <laughs> it's, like right. a, it's kind of like a crate. It's like, uh, kind of looks like marble or something. Yes, I want you to fly out of it. Now, you're on a hoverboard. How do I do that? You're going to shift your weight forward, uh -huh. and it's going to move you, move you in that direction. Guess what, you got a jetpack in your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Press the button on your left trigger. That's gonna fly you out. Yeah. Go. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. All right, so when he lands on the ground, whoa, whoa, watch whoa. out. It's too yeah, real, it it's too real. real. If you fall down, down, you're gonna feel the ground because we've got haptic feedback in there. So get off now, I don't have time. Get okay, off. Okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> that was really amazing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so. This is our first product, 30 seconds, gotcha. We're gonna turn this into a consumer product um, to start with. We need funding, we need collaborators, we need partners, and this is just the beginning. We're gonna move on to a hand device that will allow you to feel and touch virtual objects. We're Visospace, I'm Puya. Check us out on our website. Thank you very much. So, Emre, this seems something right up your alley as a virtual reality specialist, can we call you? Uh, you can, sure. certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions for Puya? Um, yeah, so uh, essentially uh, I have a lot of questions that begin with this product and also with um, your product uh, roadmap as well. So looking at you know, the usage of haptics and tactile feedback devices into the future. So what kind of consumers are you targeting specifically? The ultimate consumer is everyone. Um, virtual reality, I believe, is going to replace our phones and, and laptops. No, maybe not in this current form, but in some form factor, virtual and augmented reality is going to be the next uh, human computer interface. But for that to happen, we have to create uh, use cases, um, apps, all that stuff, but also interfaces. That's the most important thing. The mouse and the keyboard were instrumental in making the computers a thing for the home computers. Everyone's got a computer. The touch screen was instrumental in making, making this device you know, a part of our body. Without it, we can't, we can't go to the next, next phase. So movement is a huge problem in VR. It's been a problem since the 90s and hand interfaces, once people get used to that, will be the next thing. Because you want to be able to touch stuff, manipulate it. So I think the consumer is ultimately, you know, the end game is everyone. 
but in the short term, it's probably going to be uh, VR enthusiasts, um, gamers. Um, we're looking at arcades as a solution because people need to come into arcades and try VR for the first time. So I hope that that's a snippet of what you wanted. Okay, so just get it right that your parent, you're looking to pair this technology with the idea of, of hand wearables that are able to provide tactile feedback into the field. Eventually, yes. yes. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would basically ask you to look at how this specific prototype can be commercialized and then put into a, some sort of supply chain for arcades in its current format without um, having to rely on the, the future roadmap as well, possibly. Sure, sure. I think cost is going to be a huge factor. That's where arcades are, are really useful. I mean, Atari started in arcades, yep. and, and you know they were a re really big part of the computer revolution. And and we, we've we've learned from some of that, and we want to sort of follow that roadmap as well. So initially, maybe expensive, maybe it's um, enterprise solutions as opposed to consumers, but cost will come down, and that's part of our IP. We have ideas about how to bring the cost of technology down. We're really good at that. What did you think about this one, Panama? Uh, I thought it was really interesting. I'm wondering who your partners are going to be because um, as cool as it sounds to fly to the moon and pick up a rock, <clears throat> I think, you know, after about half an hour of that, maybe even 10 minutes of it, you know, you're going to want to do something. So I, I think you were hinting at it when you talked about that you think VR is going to take over from our phone so that there will be more content. That's right. And uh, I'm just wondering, um, have you, if you're, if you're going to target an arcade, it seems like your partners would probably be game, uh, gaming companies. I think and so. Yeah, have I you, agree with you. Have, have you started to pursue that? Yeah, we have been reaching out to the big players um, in very early days. So you know we're, we're very small right now, so we have to prove ourselves. We really wanted to get something low-hanging fruit, which is what this is, into the market, so we can prove ourselves and, and show traction, build a community around us. Um, as far as uh, partners go, definitely the big players are our target for us, but also developers. We need people to come help us make content and useful applications for this. Something like this can be used to allow you to move around virtual space, like um, to check out a house before you buy it, right? Right now that's done by teleporting from room to room, and that breaks your, uh, your immersion. You don't get the same continuous movement through that space that you want to visualize, right? So things like this are helpful for that. Yeah, I, th I think there's one more comment that I would make, which is that in the gaming community, they're not very worried about the physics base of their uh, models, yes. right? It, it needs to somewhat feel realistic, but it doesn't have to be very precise. Right. If you want to move into any kind of educational or engineering, uh, and, and there's probably some other applications that require you to have a much more complicated model which has Truly. the equations of motion and, and the physics built Truly. into it. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this is based on a physics engine. So, so when you move around on the auto, I'll give you a demo after, um, it's, it's momentum based. It feels real to your brain. So we're actually okay. like really bypassing some of the, um, you know, hip hypnotizing the brain to believing this is real because there's momentum and physics involved. That's what our brains want to want to experience. And that goes exactly like you said, for education, for being to model things. Um, Think about collaboration, online collaboration between engineers, you know, from different parts of the world, building something together with their own hands and actually be able to feel and touch stuff. And that's innovation on steroids. So, I see a lot of potential with that. Flavia, do you have any questions? Who is actually building this out there? Who are your competition and why is this IP, do you think, is gonna maybe be the one that is gonna enter into the market and nail it? Sure. Locomotion has been a problem from day one. There's, there's quite a few players out there trying to solve this problem. Uh, an example of it can be seen on the Ready Player One movie when you've got the treadmill underneath. That's an infinity deck. I think it costs a few, like $100,000. You know, that's, that's up there. Um, we've got treadmills that are like dishes that you slip into. Um, those are slip dishes. Um, they're about $5,000. You know? What we're making here is probably going to cost about two hundred. dollars It's going to be Bluetooth enabled and wireless. It will connect to your phone, to your standalone headsets that are, that are the future of VR. So the idea here is that something that eventually will be in people's homes so that you don't need a big space to enjoy VR. You can have a one meter by meter, one meter space and you can do it. But the thing that sets us apart from everyone outside of that is the fact that this is not a part of your body. This is a, this is a real object in the experience and in, in reality. So when you put your headset on and you look down, it's there. You can relate to it physically and then you go and stand on it and now it becomes a, a tool for you to move around. But you can always get off. Right? Getting on and off, that's part of it. 
and you can't really do that right now with the um, solutions that you got to harness in and it's you know clunky and difficult they're all really great solutions for their own use case but this is something that we eventually want to see in people's homes thank you very much for your time tonight Puya can we please give it up for Puya thank you thank you thank you now we're going to check out how our guests' rocket building attempts are going. Troy? Thank you, Ray. So one of the amazing things I get to do every day is work with startups that are building things like flying taxis and satellites and even rocket ships. Uh, and I'm seeing some of the uh, this uh, creative ability just thriving over here. Um, guys, could you just tell us a little bit about, uh, about what's special about your rockets? What's your, what's your favourite feature that you're building in right here? Um, the pipe cleaners are for um, stuff that stick out out of the um, rocket. Right. So in case like there's like an asteroid coming in the way, it might like move it away. Is that what you? Yeah, yeah. And and what about you, Emily? What what do you think your favourite feature is? Maybe how col colourful it is. Colour is a is a, the NASA rockets weren't very colourful. So that's yeah, fantastic. Well, I love where you're going with these guys. And if you keep going this way, we, we should hire these guys as engineers because they're gonna they're they're moving so much faster than aerospace has over the last fifty years. They're almost finished all the Lego already. So um, tell me a little bit about your your rocket. It almost looks like a little bit of a lander. You're gonna build around it. Uh, yeah, I've gone for a landing. I think um, the interface between pipe cleaners and Lego has been quite difficult for both teams. Uh, but I've tried to implement some landing apparatus of different items, so some wheels and some frog-like uh, shock absorbers, I guess. And um, I took a lead from Emily and I tried to incorporate maximum colour, because I think that's important in all rockets. Fantastic. Well, I have to say, as an engineer myself, I think that the most innovative part of all this is making the pipe cleaners work with Lego. Um, so, absolutely fantastic. But we'll come and uh, check out how you guys are going again very soon. Um, and over to you, Ray. Thanks, Troy. It's time for our second pitcher to enter the pitch ring. He's helping students build actual rockets. So, perhaps he could help out some of our audience over there. Would you please welcome Lewis Quill? <laughs> I'm Lewis Cole from Obelisk Systems and we make Starlab. So when me and my friend Luke finished university, we decided that we wanted to make satellites, cool little micro satellites. So we made some prototypes and we got them to work, but we couldn't find anyone to sell them to or any kind of project for them to be a part of. Um, this was a bit unfortunate, had us bummed out at the office for a while, and then one day a teacher comes in and he's like, want to come into our class, show off your satellites, the kids will think it's great. We thought it would be cool, so we went. We put the satellites in the kids' hands and they were really inspired. They were like, wow, this is something that can go to space. So we started an education company. We got our satellites, we put them on the front of a 3D printed rover, made some online lessons, some tutorials, and that became Starlab. Our main goal is to make it easy for teachers and really engaging for students. And nothing really engages students like robots and space. We also want to engage all students. So often I walk into classrooms and it's just all guys. So we talk to teachers about this problem and they really stress the importance of making things easy to use. If they can understand how it works, they can much more easily interact with the kids and get everyone encouraged. Currently we're in 100 schools, mostly in New South Wales, and over a thousand students have gone through our program. We're really happy with how it's going, but we're still looking for investors to help branch out across the rest of Australia and the world. And we're also looking for partners so that we can get to more education groups. Space is an amazing collaborative area. There's countries all over the world working together on projects. And I want the kids from Australia to grow up to work in that awesome environment. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Flavia, do you have any questions? So these are one unit satellites that you guys built? Yeah, so we built some little one unit cube satellites and that was kind of our primary prototype. We got some stuff working, but we just found that it was much more enjoyable to work in the education field. So in the, the this, this type of education course that the kids do is like, um, um, what, what do they do? Do they build the satellites? Do yep. they play with board? What do they do? Yeah, um, so they're playing with Mars rover type technology. Yep. So they're programming it, making it autonomous and focusing on those kinds of core skills because they're so important for upcoming careers. And this is a course that they follow that you prepare? 
Yep, so we prepare as much as we can for the teachers. The idea is that even if a teacher isn't very confident with technology, that they can pick it up and run with it. We think that's really important. Does it fit with the national curriculum? Yes, it does fit with the national curriculum. It's mostly been New South Wales because New South Wales has lagged behind a little bit. You guys are really ahead in Victoria. Um, but yeah, we're getting to national. How do you think you can expand it outside Australia? Um, there's a lot of similar programs, like pushes for that kind of STEM education in other countries. And so we think that we'll piggyback off them pretty well. And what about putting something in space with this robotic stuff? I would love to put something into space. It'd be really cool if we got back to that at some point to let the kids experience that at the same time. That'd be a really nice like full circle experience. Our technology is really cool and students and teachers love it. So I think that if we can start getting into other countries that yeah, it could definitely scale globally. There is this thing that running an education startup, it's hard because how can you actually scale it up? Who is going to give you funding? Who are your you know, people to support you? Because the idea of education is not to sell to people that can buy, but to people that cannot buy. Yeah. How do you see this? Um, we find that when we work with a lot of schools that don't have as much income as some of the bigger schools, that there's a lot of people in local communities that are willing to help them. And we find that Australia is a really good place for that because you have people from like mining and energy sectors, and they're really keen to give back to the communities. Pamela, do you have any questions for Lewis? I guess uh, I had the same question that Flavia did about scaling. Um, I understand that scaling would be easier without hardware, um, but I'm, I'm actually concerned that you're going to lose some of the critical value of the STEM experience uh, by not having the hands-on experience. So given that, I think that, that um, that's exactly what my question was going to be, is how, if you scale up, who's going to be building or manufacturing all these bits and pieces? and it sounds like you've already acknowledged that's a little bit of an issue. You know, it, it, it's clear you're gonna need some um, additional kinds of partnerships if you're going to other countries, uh, different curriculums, different languages, different teaching styles, different expectations for um, different ages. Have you thought about that? Yeah, we have thought about that. We've talked with some local people that have had some success, like transitioning other types of businesses overseas. Yeah, definitely our biggest barrier at the moment is like those other curriculums, the other languages. But we think that that model that we have here of making something that's easy for the teachers to use and really fun and engaging for the kids, we think that that will translate really well. Um, in terms of the hardware stuff, Definitely, if there's any partners in the audience that can help us with that kind of manufacturing, that would be awesome. But for now, I guess it's just local and we'll find out those kinds of avenues as we grow. Imre, do you have any questions? Um, I actually have a couple. So the first one is more of a clarification question because you basically only ever slightly touched on um, the idea of diversity in STEM yep. by making a comment that you, know, you were previously finding that it's all generally um, males who are attending. So do, what are your plans in, in helping kind of diversity initiatives? Yeah, um, so we're working with local primary schools in the area because what we've learned from working with them is that they have a lot of problems with using technology in the classrooms. So we're finding that they're not having the confidence to use like robotics and start doing like basic automation with like Scratch or something at early years. And so something happens between those early years and the later years where you know, all the girls fall off and maybe the boys are doing it at home. It's not really something happens. There's well, a lot of societal pressures that force that to happen. Well, but definitely. Yeah, because um, that, that ties in very strongly to the question of scaling. Yep. And um, scaling does tie into the idea of your hardware is your main point of accessibility here. Um, but if you wanted to be able to scale because investors will ask you, how are you going to make money off this? Because that's generally what they care about. Yep. Um, then, the, then you have to find the right balance between software and hardware deployments whilst retaining accessibility. So do you have a roadmap in how you want to be able to transfer your hardware into, into software in the future or into a platform? Or do you have a distribution, like thoughts on how you want to approach distribution in the future? At the moment, we 3D print everything, which is a really scalable process in itself. And so as we've getting like, we've got a recently a pretty big order to fulfill a couple of different regional areas. And so we were able to just get a couple more 3D printers and 3D print more parts. Obviously that'll have a bit of limitation in terms of like our current office, but if we start needing to produce for overseas countries, we could definitely get, you know, 50 more in and start pumping parts out. Have you thought about 
um, shipping the plants to local distributors with 3D printers instead of trying to ship the parts themselves. Um, we have looked at that. So we've done a little bit of ground research with working with a couple of local companies that have some more equipment. Um, we kind of get a lot of variance in quality and how things turn out in terms of like the end product. So we're still working that out. Hopefully we can find someone that's a lot bigger so that they could do a whole order at once. So there's a lot more consistency with what comes out of the warehouse. So yeah, hopefully that works out well. Okay, cool. I mean, and the very last thing is that um, it's a point of not criticism, but of concern is that um, a thousand people over 100 deployments is not a lot of user engagement. So um, your bandwidth and your ability to get a whole class through or multiple classes through at a very rapid pace. What, what, are you, what is your process of collecting feedback from teachers at the moment? Um, so we have feedbacks, uh, feedback in all of the courses and we get a lot of analytics about, you know, where do students struggle in certain things. Um, a bit of a problem we've had is some of the local schools that we've been working with, they've only really recently taken on STEM as an initiative. Like I was saying before, New South Wales has been a little bit slow in the take up. So as we move into other states where it's really on board. They've got like multiple classes set up. We, we think our numbers will kind of naturally rise. Thank you so much, Lewis. Thank you. We will be back with our third picture and the judging soon. But now we want to have a bit of a chat about the space startup space. Pamela, you were a puny earthling <laughs> out there in the inky depths. I do have to ask, how does that feel? Uh, puny is right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, our universe, and especially our Earth, is incredibly awe-inspiring. And one of the most amazing parts about being in low Earth orbit is going around the Earth in 90 minutes. That's everything. Everything we know, every human being you could ever meet, every piece of music you could listen to, everything, every place that you could go visit on Earth. You go around the entire thing in 90 minutes. And then you look out the window in the other direction and it, the universe goes on forever. It, it really is awe-inspiring. People have asked me, hey, you're kind of in tight quarters up there. Well, I'll tell you, when you're a puny earthling far away from your home, you want to be close to the people that, that are having that experience with you. They, um, are having this awe-inspiring experience. And uh, it's my hope, actually, with the space agency and commercial space growing, that more people have the opportunity to see the Earth from space and experience that overview effect. Now, Emre, having never been to space yourself, I'm assuming that because alien abductions do not count, <laughs> how do you get it right? when training real-life astronauts in virtual reality? I speak to Pam. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do actually speak to, uh, to astronauts. Uh, we've collaborated with, with NASA um, on the creation of some of our experiences. Um, we try and get as much anecdotes as possible, so capturing as much as we can um, to have a visual depiction of that environment is paramount because there is so much that cannot be communicated until you're actually there and you have a, the sense of the, the spatial kind of positioning of where you are. Because um, I remember the first time I actually put on a, the VR headset and looked down on a 4K map of, of the Earth and this was data that's derived from uh, the NASA blue marble images. Um, I thought it was completely off because you're so close to the ground and it's terrifying. You're moving at 27,000 kilometers per hour. When it's all built to scale inside of a virtual environment, you, you immediately gain a sense of empathy towards what someone's going through. I mean, it's never going to be one-to-one, -one, but we are taking steps to try and emulate as much as we can. Flavia, we've got our own space agency on the way, finally. How do you think the government and the private space will work together on this? Uh, first of all, I just want to take a minute to understand when and what happened this year with the space agency, because it's huge. I mean, Australia is one of, not the last one, but, you know, coming a bit later to the game. <laughs> and we have a space agency now. It's something that happened in the past 12 months. And people have been working for years. And what I've seen is 
because space is not commercial. There are all these space startup in the community. The government came along. You know, when I arrived in Australia, it was four years ago, there was one space startup in the entire country. Now that I think there are 90 plus in the window of time of four years. So it was a decision that the government had to make. Um, for people that we really don't know space, space is changing. It's not anymore the $1 billion satellites or the $10 billion rocket built by government. It's not like that anymore. Now, people like me can do space, people like us, and people like um, Elon and everyone, you know, <laughs> but it's just not Elon, right? Yeah. Okay, it's all of us, and because you do the technology as are there. And the government still has got a very important role in this, because space is hard. Space is not just building software in a, you know, with your friends or in a garage. You do build things in a garage, but you have to send them to space. <laughs> so there are a lot of barriers that needs to come down, a lot of help that we need. Um, but now we are entrepreneurs and you know, it's a private commercial time. And we're gonna go ahead anyway, but now we got an agency and it will help us because Australia now is, is yes, arriving a little bit later, but it can propel to the future, right? This is our first commercial space agency in, on Earth. And I think we're gonna see amazing things in the next 15. We don't even have any idea. We're just scratching the surface. So should be very proud. It's exciting. Absolutely. It's really exciting. Now, Pamela, space tech isn't just for out there. What are the ways it can be used on our current home planet? Wow, well, all kinds of space tech has, has been uh, used in a lot of different ways, even in what we call traditional space or space 1.0, uh, just uh, sending humans to space regularly on the space shuttle and certainly living aboard the space station. Things like telemedicine, mm -hmm. uh, water reclamation technologies, uh, CO2 recovery technologies. Uh, those are technologies that NASA had to solve uh, with their partners and, dis and is, they're being disseminated to other places that need them. But I think what's really exciting about Space 2.0 is that we're beginning to see that our world is a global world and we are deeply connected. Markets are all connected with each other. Uh, things are happening at a rapid scale. The only way that you can keep track of those things and keep people connected eventually it's going to have to be done from space. It's the only place that at a relatively low cost, I know people aren't used to thinking about space as low cost, but when you think about trying to connect everyone throughout Australia, how hard that, that can be to do, but from space it's a much simpler problem. So I, I think uh, what you're seeing is this space 2.0 technologies that are impacting agriculture, um, fishing, mining, uh, homeland security, all of those things. And I've always felt that exploration is about improving the human condition. And Flavia, to your point, in business, it's called being a fast follower. Hmm. And I think that's where Australia is right now, where you learn from those ahead of you and you rapidly catch up and even overtake them. Now, Emre, do you think VR will be used in other areas of space tech, maybe virtual tourism? Yes. So virtual reality is already being deployed onto the International Space Station. So we are going to see the deployment of virtual reality as a form of telepresence with home and family, um, as a form of diagnosis as well, uh, as a tool for astronauts to use when, when exercising um, and for self-assessment um, when ap applicable. So there's going to be a number of different fields ranging from human performance to, to even medicine where virtual reality has a place. And I think that there are some red herrings around that. So the idea of the robonauts being controlled uh, from Earth in, is something that's quite debatable because of the latency around, around, around signal processing. Um, but it can mean that you, know, you can be at the, the Coppola um, and have a VR headset and control uh, a robonaut that's with, um, uh, with an astronaut, basically. Mm -hmm. And those things start to open up the, the, the cost, reduce risk, and also um, remove elements that have you know, permanent impact on, onto astronauts that are there, uh, which can help us provide a much safer and a much more accessible environment. So, yeah. 
Flavia, traditionally in the old days, uh, it costs $20,000 to get a kilo of matter into space. Yep. Elon says he's got it down to $2,000 a kilo. How long will it be before space travel is actually affordable? Will I be too old by then? Please don't crush my dreams. <laughs> uh, well, I, I actually think that Elon is not just him, but you know, a few entrepreneur are creating such a fast innovation revolution that we cannot even grab it. And I've got a two years old and a four years old, and I'm 100% sure, not a, I don't know about myself, but I'm sure my four years old, she will be traveling in intense spaceship. One thing that I'm super fascinated about is, you know, the opportunity not just to go to Mars, but also what we can do for us on Earth. You know, the ability to go from 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 Melbourne to London in, in one hour. Imagine the world that we will live if you can actually ship like an Amazon service that you get everything in 30 minutes, or you can have people having meetings and moving faster. We kind of not understand that this is the next phase of transportation. Exactly what happened when we had a plane and everyone was like. It's going to be safe. Are we going to go on it? Does it make any sense? I will surely not bring my toddler there. But <laughs> it's the new thing. It's going to happen. How close it is, I think it's actually closer than what we think. There, there are cycles in innovation. They usually last 20, 25 years. It takes time for technologies to happen. And it takes really most probably five years to a point that they are safe for people to use them. Yeah. We are getting there. So even if we see, you know, Elon or Richard or Jeff, doing their things and using a lot of money to try to make that happen. And we always think, is it going to happen? Innovation takes time. Yeah. And adoption takes even longer. But I think, we are I think you will see it. I think you will actually see it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> we'll be OK. And it's gigantic. It's, it's the world is going to change. So we live in a moment in time where we're actually going to see this. Yeah. And we're going to see the first person on Mars. I'm sure we will in our lifetime. Yes, excellent. All right, I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, investing in space tech is getting more mainstream. You know, there's VC firms like Space Angels that specialise in the sector. Aside from the cool factor, which is pretty obviously already there, uh, how can entrepreneurs in the area be more enticing to investors, do you think? Yeah. I think space is yeah. extremely cool. And trust me, I'm as big a nerd as anyone and very excited about well, you've it. Been there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you. Um, you have to be very pragmatic about it. And, uh, you know, just the same way I had a job to do when I was in space, uh, it was sort of like, wow, that's amazing out the window. Let's, let's get going with the spacewalk. And we had things to do. And I think it's very important um, to keep that sense of joy and wonder. And at the same time, the pragmatism that Flavia was talking about, how are you going to make money doing this? And I'd, I'd also add that a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about space and their technology have a really hard time articulating the value proposition mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense to people. Uh, they want to get right down in the weeds and tell you about this cool technology and how it'll do this and how it'll do that. And they don't ever get to the point about what is the intellectual property in that? Or what is the value? Uh, and, and so when I was at uh, DARPA, we used uh, what we called the Heilmeyer questions. And it was a series of questions developed by a previous head of DARPA um, that to focus your attention, what are we trying to do? Uh, what's different about your approach uh, from what everyone else has done? If you're successful, who will care? And how will you know that you're making progress? What are your milestones? Those kinds of questions. Um, and, and it's very hard to actually peel back all the layers on your tech and your idea and get to that beautiful nugget. But it's really important to do, especially for non-space savvy investors. Thank you so much to our space crew here for their wisdom tonight. We will be back in a moment with our third pitch and our panel will decide on the winner. But first, here's tonight's bedtime story from our favourite, Alan Jones. Oh, hello, founders. I didn't notice you there. Don't you love a good story about the future? I've got a good story about the future too. Would you like to hear it? It's called The Three Little Startups. Once upon a time, there lived three little startups. One day, 
Her mother told them they would have to move out of the bungalow because she was putting it up on Airbnb to avoid being on at them to go through some boxes of old school stuff they never pick up. Anyway, the three little startups went off to seek their fortune by creating rival location-based peer-to-peer shopping recommendation platforms. The first little startup built her location-based peer-to-peer shopping recommendation platform using her credit card and money borrowed from friends. The second little startup built his location-based peer-to-peer shopping recommendation platform on a small business grant and a handshake agreement with a judge on Shark Tank. But the third little startup let their location-based peer-to-peer shopping recommendation platform grow organically, only taking on investors who wanted to take an active role in the company, reinvesting their profits and keeping control of the business. Then one day, the big bad crushing reality came along. The big bad crushing reality got to the first little startup who had a nervous breakdown. The big bad crushing reality also got to the second little startup easily, who went to live in an ashram. But when the big bad crushing reality came for the third little startup, it also got to them because statistically speaking, over 70% of new businesses fail in the long term. And the moral of the story is that the world doesn't need another location-based peer-to-peer shopping recommendation platform, and that's just the end of that. The end. And now it's time for bed, little founders, and just remember, while you sleep, your rivals may pounce, but you'll ultimately have more staying power because you have a work-life balance. Good night. third picture tonight comes from the world of robots. That's right, people. There's a world of robots. And if they know about us, I assume we're all doomed. Would you please welcome Nikki Rosso. Hello, everyone. My name is Nikki. I've moved 25 times in my life, so I'm particularly passionate about connecting people to each other. I'm the founder and CEO of Exaptic, a textile startup based in Melbourne. We import, rent and sell telepresence robots, companion robots such as this one, and service robots. What these robots all have in common is that they connect us to each other. So 15% of Australians are over the age of 65. We are living longer, and we are aging. And for some of us, they're lonely, disconnected, and they don't have a support network. This is where this little robot comes into play as it's already connecting people in aged care homes today in Australia. Exaptic believes customized software for the robots will transform the lives of our elderly citizens. We've been running for three years We've quadrupled our revenue. We've got a staff of four, and we've just appointed our advisory board with Dr. Sue Kay and Leanne Kemp. We have also been nominated and have come in the top 200 uh, companies in Australia for Westpac's businesses for tomorrow. We'd like to raise some revenue so that we can do um, more software development for the robots that we work with. And we're looking for a CTO who wants to put some skin in the game and join our company. My name is Nikki Rousseau. We are Exaptic. Thank you. Paula, do you have any questions for Nikki? Uh, So my first question is, uh, it seems like your uh, secret sauce or your intellectual property is around uh, purchasing hardware from that's already been developed elsewhere and you tailor software to it is that correct that's correct yes yeah it's very hard to um uh fence off that kind of ip what do you think your competitive edge is well i think for us first it's, it would be like a bit like having an app store for robotics which is what we envision developing and um we want to be the leaders five to seven years. There's a massive global market out there. 
Although the adoption rate in Australia in robotics has been a bit slow, and we have had people contact us because we have actually done some app developments for the hardware that we've got. So it sounds like you think basically it's an underserved market and, and so you have the opportunity to get in there early uh, and not have the hardware investment, but focus instead on the software, is yes. that correct? Yes, definitely. Imre, do you have any questions? It's actually on the back of, back of your line of questions as well, because I think that defensible IP in the sector of robotics is, is paramount. It's very, very critical because you're fighting against um, so many different industries that have all their own deployments of robotics. So um, you've touched on these three things a little bit and, I, and I'd appreciate if you kind of expand them a little bit. So um, can you tell us a bit more about your software, your platform ambitions, and then also your hardware licensing deals if you have any? Uh, yes, okay, so I'll touch on your last one. Buddy, um, the companion robot that's been released, um, it's a French developer and it was nominated as the most innovative robot at the Consumer Electronics Show 2018. We actually the exclusive distributor in Australia and New Zealand. So that's a massive accolade for a company such as Exaptech. Um, the software development, the platforms that we're working with, um, if it's open source, then we're able to work with it. So um, languages being Python, Android, I'm not specifically technical, I've got tech people that work with that, but yes, that's what we're doing. In terms of the IP of it, um, I think for us is having an app store that we could either have it as a service that we rent out with the hardware, which is where I see it going, because then we can also update the software as new development comes along and our clients get more sophisticated in their, their needs. Flavia, do you have any questions? So, um, are your ambition just in Australia or you want to dominate? Oh, dominate is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> cool um, for this, uh, this show. This, uh, <laughs> yes. What do you think? Look, I, th I think in terms of the software developer, we we one of five companies in the world doing what we do. Um, we're very specialised and just the mere fact that we've got companies that are already dealing in the hardware that we do, contacting us and asking us for assistance in software development, I think there's a massive global market for us to get into. What do you think is necessary for you to scale up and reach, you know, could you resell this all around the world? Could you just create a platform for people to buy? How do you see this company in four years? Four years from now, I see us having an app store for robotics that anyone with a hardware can contact us, no matter what it is, and go, can you use the software for this hardware that we've got? Because there's such a massive range of hardware that's been developed out in the world. It's, it's enormous, the money being thrown at robotics. So um, for us to scale, investment in the company would be good. Um, we're the only company in Australia of its kind doing what we are and robotics is such a, um, it's such a flavour of the month, you know, everyone's talking about robotics. It would, it would be excellent if we could see some investment in a company such as ours. Now Nikki, are your robots going to take my job? Never. Thank you. You're irreplaceable. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Would you please thank Nikki everybody? Well, Emre, Flavia and Pamela have a tough decision ahead of them for who wins tonight's pitch ring. While they're deliberating, we'll see how our audience's rockets are going. So, guys, just what, what do you have to say? How did you come up with this idea and, and what advice do you have for us mere earthlings? The kids had a good structure and a good tunnel and we had a good landing module, so we thought we'd put our strengths together, I guess. So what, what's special about your lunar modules? Um, they're supposed to be me tanks that protect the rocket. Fantastic, because of course there's all the Martians and we're, we, we need to collaborate to build this amazing thing. We can't let the Martians take over it though. Uh, Congratulations, you're all winners today. Thank you so much. Um, everybody give them a huge round of applause for what they've just done. I'm so excited to find out who has won tonight's pitch ring. Judges, who did you like? 
Well, first we wanted to say, Puya, Lewis, Nikki, all of you did a fantastic job tonight. You kept your cool under the questions. You have clearly some really innovative ideas. Uh, you're really doing some exciting things and we enjoyed hearing about your work so much. We thought you all did uh, a fantastic job this evening. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, you, you made it tough for us. We uh, had to talk about it a lot, but uh, I think in the end, we decided that Nikki and Exaptic uh, had the greatest potential for scaling and the greatest uh, potential market. And uh, so that's why we selected Nikki. Congratulations, Nikki! This is your universe. <laughs> Awesome. Now Nikki goes in the running to compete in the grand final where she could win some fantastic prizes. Would you please join me in thanking our panel, Flavia, Emre, Pamela, we'll see you in orbit. <laughs> Next week, Ben will be back with me to show you the money as we look at startup funding. Not all money is equal. In fact, if it's Bitcoin, it's changed value since I began this sentence. And don't forget, if you want to be in our audience here at the Good Shed in Melbourne on Thursdays after work, grab your tickets at thatstartupshow.tv. We'll see you all next week for a capital adventure. Bye. Well done. Congratulations. What really drives you to, to work really hard on this startup? Because it's been a few years now. Um, I guess it was just a really exciting concept for me throughout my life. Space is just this really massive, crazy thing. And so being able to work with it some way, I guess that's just something I've always wanted to do. Seeing how kids can be inspired that and how that can help teachers with education, I guess it just made it into a really practical thing. In 10 years time, or 20 years time, 30 years time, what other areas could you see your company uh, innovating in? Great question. Telerobotics. So what I didn't manage to say before was when you go to the moon and you pick up that rock, that you are actually in the moon and that is a real rock that you're picking up because there'll be a, a, a micro manipulator, a robot out there in space that you can control with your body. What is your vision? What would you really like to achieve in say 10 or 20 years time? I think for us it would be known as the, um, the expert in robotics in Australia and certainly the leaders in app development for hardware globally as well as Australia.